This is Thursday, June 16, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today William Gallagher. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? March 12th, 1947. <clears throat> and where were you born? Newton, Mass. And where are you living now? Natick. What's your marital status? Divorced. Do you have children? One son. Still lives with me. <coughs> Any grandchildren? No. no. Not yet. <laughs> Tell me what Newton was like uh, back in the 1960s. I think I'd rather be back there then. There was no, not as much violence as there is today, you know. Mm -hmm. Not that there's violence in Newton, but Newton has changed. You know, it's mm -hmm. gotten to be still multi-million dollar homes now mm -hmm. and stuff like that. What part of Newton did you grow up in? Originally, down on Gardner Street, which is off of Pearl Street, mm -hmm. which was across from Lincoln Elliott School. Okay. And where and when did you enter the military? Numerous occasions, but first I went in the Air Force in 1965. <clears throat> and I was stationed down at Otis for a year. Then they sent me to Germany for three years, mm -hmm. which I had a time dealing with. I was homesick, you know, I was immature. Mm -hmm. and to make a long story short, they gave me an armor discharge. So I'm home for two years, and I'm really not doing you no know, jobs, not going anywhere. So everybody was getting drafted. So I volunteered for the draft. Mm -hmm. And they went to Fort Dix for a year, and then they sent me to Vietnam. Tell us a little more about your three years in the Air Force. Uh, why did you choose the Air Force? It was probably the easier of all of them, you know. The, mm -hmm. the, uh, the basic training is only six weeks, you know. It was and what did you do when you were in the Air Force? Air Police, both security and law enforcement. And you mentioned before you were in Otis Air Force Base? Yes. And where in West Germany were you stationed? Uh, Ramstein Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And anything you remember about that besides being homesick? Well, the climate's the same as the United States, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I did a lot, of, they pulled me off the flight line, they made me do, uh, like do barracks duty, mm -hmm. stuff like that, until they figured out what they were gonna do with me. Okay, and what rank did you leave the Air Force? E2. I never got promoted. Now, what were you doing in the two years between Air Force and Army? Various jobs, you know, mm -hmm. little carpentry, you know, landscaping, stuff like that, you know. I, I, I never had really a steady job. Okay. So now you decided to enter the Army. This is now 1968. Eight. And you volunteered. Yes. So what happened then? I went to basic to Fort Dix, mm -hmm. and we, uh, they sent me to uh, radio school, which I flunked out of, thank God. Then they sent me to truck driving school, and that was much better. And I was stationed, to, we used to drive the cattle cars, which means it's like a mini tractor trailer. We'd be bring, bring the trainees out to the firing ranges, mm -hmm. and that's what I did basically for a year, until I got my orders. Well, technically, I didn't really have to go to Vietnam, mm -hmm. it had I not gone in the Army. But that's so it. <laughs> and by a quirk of fate, you got into Vietnam. So uh, you went to Vietnam in uh, 1968? Correct. And what month? March. March, okay. You know what's ironic? I went in the Air Force in March, mm -hmm. went in the Army in March, and I went to Vietnam in March. And your birthday's in March, March. so it's a, it's, a, it's a strange little month uh, for you. So tell us what Vietnam was like. Well, it's like everybody says, excuse me, <clears throat> we, I left here in March, right? It took us 26 hours. Mm -hmm. well, well, I went to Oakland first for three days to get, you know, equipment and stuff like that. So we, get on the, we went to Oak, uh, Hawaii for an hour, mm -hmm. Wake Island for an hour, Okinawa for an hour to refuel, and then we landed in Benoit. Mm -hmm. And it's like they say, as soon as you step off that plane, it's like a melting pot. I mean, it's extremely hot over there. 
And people complain about the heat around here. You don't have a clue. <laughs> it's every day. You don't get a break over there. Mm -hmm. When um, back, I believe in the 1990s, you were uh, the subject of a Boston Globe article, and you were mentioning what Saigon was like in the 1960s. Tell us a little bit about that. It was in '69, so I. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said in the article, mm -hmm. the, uh, the city was designed for 50,000 people, but mm -hmm. there was like a million. And at one time, I guess Saigon was the Pearl of the Orient. So I, I've been mm -hmm. told. But it was, you know, it's like any city. They have their nice spots, but they have their, you know, their mm -hmm. bad spots. But it was a busy place. Mm -hmm. So what were, what were you doing in Saigon? First, they stuck me out. I, first, they stuck me out at a a warehouse in Tonsonu. I was, you know, just stay there and if somebody needed something, hand it out. Well, I was there for about two months and the first sergeant said, would you like to come down here out of the Civic Actions Office and work, work with me? And I said, sure. So I would, I basically became a truck, I drove this uh, International Scout, mm -hmm. a pickup truck and a flatbed that I would deliver various things to villages, leprosy colonies, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What was it like in a leprosy colony? Uh, well, they d wouldn't let me get near it. Uh-huh. I drove up there, and then, you know, we, we would just kick the stuff off the trucks that we'd leave, and then whatever they did. I didn't get that close. They wouldn't allow me to. Not that I wanted to, either. <laughs> um, anything more about Saigon? It's, well, I saw some not-so-pleasant things, like mm -hmm. I. I was in tra traffic jam, bump it up, bump up. I was leaving headquarters area command mm -hmm. on my way back to the civic actions office. I'm like, oh, geez, what's the problem here? Finally, I get to it. There's a young lady, this is going to get graphic. Mm -hmm. There's a young lady with her face and head underneath the tires of a bus. And she's right here. I can still uh -huh. see her as I talk to you. I can't tell you what she looked like, but I can tell you what she was wearing a white blouse, a white black pleated skirt like the school girls wear, white nylons, and black buckle shoes. See, I'll never forget that. She was just right there. Wow. I had to stand there for a couple of minutes. And she, poor girl, just probably got bumped off her moped, and that was mm -hmm. it. I mean, another time I was on my way to work, and I, uh, we, the, the police, we call them white mice because they, they wear white shirts, and mm -hmm. Vietnamese are generally small. Well, they're looking down, and, and I see what they're looking at. The, some guy was all blown a pee a bits. He was, uh, he's still alive. I guess I found out he was like a VC who was going to set off a charge. It went off prematurely. Mm -hmm. But it's, you see things like that all the time. Uh-huh. So how long were you in Saigon? Approximately ten and a half months. Mm -hmm. I had broken my hand. Tell I, us what happened with your hand. I had eight weeks left in country, mm -hmm. and I was unloading the truck, and we used to uh, deliver bales of clothing from the Catholic Relief Fund, mm -hmm. and they weighed about 200, 200 250 pounds. Mm -hmm. Well, I was trying to move, jockey it over the side of the truck, and it caught me, I tripped, and I snapped my wrist, you know, I felt like I broke my, fall, my wrist. Uh -huh. So I let it go, for, which is right there. So I let it go for two weeks, and I finally said, no, I can't take that, I couldn't move it, you know. So mm -hmm. I went to the... Uh, Medivac, whatever, it wasn't the Medivac, the uh, field hospital. And the guy, you know, he took an x-ray. In those days, x-rays took a long time. But he finally came back and says, yeah, it's broken, which actually turned out to be fractured. But mm -hmm. he says, uh, you're going to have to wear a cast for eight weeks. And I said, wait a minute, I've, I've only got six weeks in country. So we, uh, he said, wait here. He came back a couple of minutes later, he goes, be here at 0700, we're sending you home. Which, at the time, I was elated, you know, happy. Mm -hmm. And then they put a cast on it. So that, that day, I had to go on and say goodbye to people, you know, get my orders and mm -hmm. squared away and stuff like that. And the, uh, which I did. But the next day is, is the killer for me. They shipped, they shipped me over to the 106 General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I changed into the pajamas. And they walked me into the bay, the hospital area. All those wounded soldiers. I mean, full body cast, missing limbs, mm -hmm. uh, thighs blown off. One guy was in a corner over there, he lost his mind. He was just a vegetable. And I'm mm -hmm. sitting there going to myself, Billy, you have no right being with these men, you know. I mean, I was going home, but that's, I'll never forget that, you know. It's it. 
Another thing was anybody more mobile had to hold down, they changed their bandages. For instance, this guy had his thigh blown off. And they took the cast, piece of cast, and there's a, a cloth with a solution on it. Mm -hmm. And they did this four times a day. So he would tie, the orderly would tie his left foot to the wheelchair, and I would have to get on my left hand, I mean my left knee, and down hold his left arm, and then that guy would have to hold his right arm, and they had to tie his, like, right to the wheelchair. And then they would peel this thing off slowly. <laughs> you can't, mm. you'll never forget the screams and the cries and the cursing, and, the, and they did that four times a day. And they, uh, they did that to him for what, six days, I think. Uh -huh. And not just him, but it was other people too, you know. Everybody had to help, the orderly, help each other out. Mm -hmm. There was one guy, he was in a full body cast. I mean, head to the wrist, to the ankles. I don't know what he got hit with, but that was, that was he was the first thing I saw in that. And I just, it, it's just like in a, in a movie where the, the camera pans a circle. Uh -huh. That's exactly what I was doing. I'm looking around, going, wow, look at this. I'm here with a lousy mm -hmm. fractured wrist and I'm with all these wounded kids, you know. Uh -huh. So there's images that I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, had the effects of jungle rot, right? In my feet, yeah, yes. and other areas mm -hmm. for my feet, yeah. Mm -hmm. They got really infected, like I said, and they took my toenail off. Mm -hmm. It never grew back right. Mm -hmm. And how long you, were you in the hospital? <sighs> the 106 General Hospital, well, I wrote a poem about that one too, but uh, mm -hmm. Six days, and then the seventh day I left. Uh -huh. I remember when this kid was leaving, with, they had his thigh, his, his thigh blown off. Uh -huh. I mean, you could have stuck your finger in the bullet hole. But uh -huh. When he was leaving, he, they pushed him out in the wheelchair, and you know, he saw his, he's giving everybody the bird. See you later, suckers. Which was a little, that wound didn't mean anything to him now. Uh -huh. you know, he was going home. Same with the other kid, that had his forearm blown off. You know, those were million dollar wounds to them. They were going home. Mm -hmm. They were they were kind of funny sometimes until that orderly walked in with that cut. Then their faces got all distorted, knowing what was going to happen. You know, that's they try to sleep at night, hearing all the moans. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't very pleasant. Okay. Aside from your experiences in Saigon and in the hospital, which most of them were, were plenty to begin with. Uh, did you ever have direct uh, contact with the en enemy? No, I did not. I, the only thing that a rocket land, I stayed in a hotel. They put me up in a hotel, which mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans going to roll their eyes and I was, oh, you lucky dog. Mm -hmm. And I was, but the only thing that ever happened was a rocket landed outside the hotel. I can't tell you what time of day, mm -hmm. but that's all you hear was that boom, boom. So you're back home. Yes. And now it's uh, 1969-1970? I come home in January 70. I, they, they discharged me from Fort Devens. Mm -hmm. And some couple of guys came to pick me up. What happened then? Well, believe it or not, the city of Newton hired me about a month after I was home. Mm -hmm. We were hiring vets. And I was, in the, I was doing the rubbish. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I did that up until May and I, I quit the city. It was, mm -hmm. You know, I probably could have transferred, but I hated it. It was a, uh, I don't know, it just, I didn't like that at the time. Plus, I had just come home. I was, con I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, was happy to get a job, but, you know, you're still confused about, you know, what do you really want to do? Mm -hmm. So, I left the city, and then I just did various things through the 70s. What kind of things? Oh, carp again, carpentry, landscape, roofing, you know, with different companies, construction. Mm-hmm. I did, uh, in 1979, I think I got a job down the, uh, I don't think I do, uh, the Army Materials Research Center as a DOD police. Mm -hmm. I did that for almost two years, and then cable was coming along. Somebody says, that's what you want to get into. Mm -hmm. So I went to cable, and then I, I got out of that. <laughs> I've done a lot of things in my life. I've uh -huh. never, never done one job for 50 years. I've done many things. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to the early 70s, and you just coming back from Vietnam. What were your um, thoughts about the war and about the anti-war protesting? Well, it's funny you brought that up, because there were times I didn't want to admit I was a veteran for that purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd, people would be calling you a baby killer, which I, I never confronted anybody anyway. You know, I never mm -hmm. shot at, I never got shot at, never shot, I would never make that claim. 
but the, the protesters were pretty mean in those days. You know what I mean? I did a lot of marijuana in this area, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that in 29 years. Okay. But that was a time, that's what you did in those days. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't admit that. But. Well, I'm sure you're not going to get arrested no. now. So tell us a bit, um, you also were in the National Guard. Tell us a little bit about that. I joined the Guard in 1984, yeah, I do, 84. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they call it a try one. You go in for one year. If you like it, you re enlist. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you get up. I re enlisted. I did five years. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was the 26 SNT. I liked that outfit. That was a good outfit. But they changed it over the years. Then I went, sorry, I'm speeding there. That's okay. Then I went back in the garden in 80, 88. I got out in 2001. I, I just got bored. Uh -huh. It was, you hang around the armory doing the same. How many times can you clean the M16? Stuff like that. And now I'm kicking myself because I could be collecting a pension. Mm -hmm. So let us uh, get into your other career, so to speak, your poetry. Yeah. How did you get into poetry? When I got married, mm -hmm. the f our first anniversary, mm -hmm. I started writing this poem, how, how we met, and it's really long, mm -hmm. but it all rhymes and stuff. And I, uh, and then I never wrote, and then last, 20 years, I've just been banging them out. Something mm -hmm. hits me, and you know, I've written for so many people who have died. I've read them at the wakes. Mm -hmm. uh, people got married, children born, you know, whatever, whatever hits me. Whatever hits you. So, in fact, you won an award for at least one of your poems, and yeah, I have it, was, it right here, the the one called Self Pity. Yeah, it's about yes, it's about a. Uh, well, any homeless vet, I guess you would say. Okay, would you like to read, sure. read it for us? Mm -hmm. Titled So Pity. My heart is broken as I live in pain. I had it all as I sit in the rain. My house was big, it had lots of room. She was my bride, I was her groom. Beautiful children and a loving wife who could ask for more, it was a wonderful life. The joys of laughter at holiday time, I no longer laugh, so pity is my crime. The experience of war is engraved in my heart. My family tried, but it tore them apart. I learned my trade in the school of hard knocks. Now I live in the hollows of a cardboard box. I lost it all as I sit in the rain. Maybe a drink will help ease the pain. And that won the commendation from? Outstanding Achievement in Poetry. Mm-hmm. That's a great achievement. <laughs> that was in 90, 97. 97. So, wow, that flew by. Mm -hmm. Were you ever interested in poetry in high school? or Nope. No? Never took a writing lesson. Mm -hmm. I quit high school, to be honest with you. Where were you attending at the time? Newton North. The old Newton North. Mm -hmm. And it just hit you. It hit, I just, yeah, it, it did. Just. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I don't know how I do it actually. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's get back to the Vietnam experience, so to speak. Over the years, have you seen a change in attitude toward Vietnam veterans? How would you describe it? It, it has gotten better. Because I mean, mm -hmm. back when we came back, even the World War II veterans were kind of like a little uh, anti-Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. They said some, well, I don't know what they said, but... You know, they kind of, things have gotten better though. I mean, it's, uh, the VA has gotten better mm -hmm. lately. Mm -hmm. That was a trip. It's almost anybody can tell you going to the VA. Now let's talk about an event that took place earlier this month, the moving wall yes. coming to Natick. And what was that like for you? I try to hold my emotions in, mm -hmm. but I met a gentleman there, a daughter, and he was there with his wife, and his wife goes, I was wearing my captain, she goes, did you serve in Vietnam? I goes, yes, it was 1969, mm -hmm. and this guy's crying, he goes, I was there in 67. I says, oh, you're two years my senior. And he said, but I was the last one out, all the rest of them were killed, ambushed, wow. you know, and he's crying, 
it, it, it is a, it's not just that it's a mobile moving wall, it's moving emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, when you see all those names, it is, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was great to see veterans, you know, mm -hmm. deal with it. Were the, did you know anybody yes. whose names were on the wall? I know of some, mm -hmm. but I had a good friend of mine, Frankie Turbot. Uh -huh. He got killed in, I don't, he got killed in Dong Ha. He, he got killed in the sleep, what I heard. He was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So the Air Force, you know, you can get killed in the rear too. Not as, quite as in the fear, but I wouldn't know anything mm -hmm. about that. But Before the interview, you also mentioned an interpreter who was killed in action. Uh, can you say a few words we about had, that? Yeah, we had two, uh, Mr. Mr. Min and Mr. Hep. Mm -hmm. They were the interpreters. Uh, Mr. Hep happened to come in, and Mr. Min, we got along good. I got along good with the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. you know, they used to have a rating system in Vietnam. GIs, one to 10, I was always number one. I don't know why. But he, uh, Mr. Hep came in one day, out in the civic actions, and, was, and he's crying, he says, Captain Minnick, uh, Mr. Min is dead. He got killed on his moped. I don't know how. I mean, it, it was an occurring thing over there. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of actions over there. And if you've ever been in one of those over there, it's just like ants. You, know, you could come up to a stop sign alone, and next thing you know, you've got bicycles, mopeds. Mm -hmm. They're all around you, and you can see why. Mm -hmm. Some Have you been back to Vietnam since the no. war ended? I had a friend that did that. Mm -hmm. He had an exchange student from Vietnam, and this is a few years back. Few years back, but he. Uh, she invited, she was getting married in Vietnam, she invited him back, he went back there. Mm -hmm. So he, this is how it was, he goes, nothing's changed, Billy. <laughs> nothing's changed. And uh, what are some of the awards and commendations that you've received? If I could take my glass. Well, that's the only commendation for my service over there. Uh-huh. Uh, that's the army team that I, I re received in the National Guard for a, a two weeks on the camp. Mm -hmm. This is a, a commemorative medal, it's uh, the Cold War. That's 10 years in the National Guard. That's the good conduct. Uh, that's a nine year ribbon for serving in a com combat area. Mm -hmm. That's National Defense, two of those. That's the Vietnam service with three battle stars. Mm -hmm. That's the National Guard achievement. It's almost like the good conduct. Okay. That's just a, a service ribbon, and that's a Vietnam campaign. Mm -hmm. I know that you were reluctant to admit that you were a veteran when you first got back, but since then, did you uh, join any service organizations? Took a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm a member of the VFW in Natick. Mm -hmm. Actually, I've been a member of a few. Like, I've lived in uh, you know, Blackstone, Bellingham, mm -hmm. Wayland. I didn't join the one in Sudbury. But I, 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 I've joined here twice in uh -huh. the 17 years I've been here. I'm a member of the uh, DAV. Mm -hmm. I was a member of the AMVETS, but I'm, we won't go there. We won't go there, okay. So, would you like to read the, the poem? About the wall? Yes. Sure. And this, was, this poem was recited by Paul Carew, Natick Veteran Service Agent, yes. at the uh, Moving Wall Ceremonies on Friday, June 10th. That's correct. Okay, entitled The Wall. These are the names that appear on the wall. They are the ones who answered the call. They went to war unselfish in mind. Their only fear was for family behind. They waved goodbye in tears of pain. Some never to see the little boys again. Some left as boys and returned as men. Most kept it inside, some wrote it in pen. War is hell, it's a bottomless grave. Ask all the parents about the sons that they gave. Sometimes in death, I believe God was just kind. For we are the tortured, for the souls left behind. So many have died in this futile game. Of the many that fell, some had no name. There is peace and death that fuels the drive. It's the tears of the living that keeps them alive. A branch was taken from the family tree. They gave their lives so we could be free. To serve your country is an honorable deed. For some to let others do it is selfish greed. Some made a protest, they refused to fight. They should pray to the souls who gave them that right. These are the ones who answered the call. That's why the names appear on the wall. That's very nice, thank you. Mm. Being a um, veteran yourself, 
and having witnessed some of the more recent engagements, give us your thoughts about the current uh, engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. I feel sorry for these. I mean, these kids are doing what I say kids, they're, they're, they're men. But mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're doing two, three, four tours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking to a guy in, Newton, in the Newton Parade side. He's going back off his territory. He says, people just don't understand, mm -hmm. and I don't. So, just a shame. You mentioned earlier you do have a son. Yes. And tell us a bit about him. He's 29. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually just got engaged last year. He's getting married next July. He, uh, they went on a Disney World. He took off on a hot air balloon. He mm -hmm. got engaged in a hot air balloon. Wow. So. Did he ever serve in the military? No, he can't anyway. He's deaf on his left ear. Ah. He had an injury. At a, mm -hmm. Did any other family members uh, serve in the military? My brother Bobby, who's dead now. Mm -hmm. He served in Okinawa. He was in the Army. And my mm -hmm. brother Jimmy, he's dead. He's, also, he's the youngest. Was. So he, uh, he served in the Army too. My brother Russell didn't. Mm -hmm. And I have two sisters. Anything else you would like to say uh, for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Just, you know, say welcome home, shake hands, you know. You know, I didn't get a lot of that in the 70s, mm -hmm. I must tell you. I mean, it's a lot better now. I mean, people come up, if, I only wear this on occasion. Mm -hmm. But even if I have my hat, my baseball cap, with my medals on it, people will come up once and say, hey, thanks for serving. No, thank you. you know, I, so I get the, a lot of that now, which, I'm, you know, it makes you feel better, you know. You, you didn't do something for nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that people appreciate, appreciate it, you know. But just it's hard to believe it was 42 years ago. Really? And, and believe it or not, it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. You get those images that you see. And I didn't have a bad in Vietnam. I was in Saigon. Fortunately, I wasn't in the field. I don't know what it's like to be in a firefight. I used to see them in the distance. Mm -hmm. God, you know, you see the flares. And glad I'm not out there. Mm. Well, William Gallagher, we thank you for your service. And we thank you for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral okay. History Project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you.